<laughs> Hello everybody, welcome, welcome back. So, <laughs> today we're going to talk about classic problem in philosophy. Um, some people say it's an unsolved problem. It's called the problem of other minds. How do you know that others are conscious, that they experience a rich inner life just as you do? And the solution that I will provide is original. It is new. Well, it was posted in Quilla Computing, you know, six years ago or so, and it's been extensively discussed within the Qualia Research Institute. But, you know, it's not something you will find <laughs> in academic papers, in the literature. Even if you, you know, are a you know, PhD student in philosophy of mind, I do not expect you to have encountered this uh, particular solution. Or if you're a, you know, very or somebody very interested in mind uploading and AI and consciousness and read all of less wrong and AI papers and so on. Also, I don't expect you to actually have encountered the solution. Um, and yes, I mean, I do have the confidence to say that I actually think this is a, you know, advancing the field, actually providing a way forward. Now, uh, before I go into it, let's do the Quilia of the day, which he is wire puzzles so these are really cool uh i really enjoy them i think as an aside if you know you want to send me a gift by you know for whatever reason you know niche perfumes you know fun gadgets and fun experiences and wire puzzles are always appreciated especially especially if they're like new it, you know i'm a big collector of like little things like that like have yeah entire boxes of wire puzzles and obviously a lot of uh, perfumes and little experiences um, fun gadgets that stimulate the mind in novel ways. So, um, but wire puzzles, I actually think there's a very, very deep kind of like rich set of metaphors and ideas that can come out of these, these puzzles. I mean, for one, um, it really teaches you to try to distinguish between the trivial and the significant. For example, for this particular puzzle, the idea is that you have to take out this, I guess, uh, piece, uh, out of this wiggly shape. And yeah, I mean, if you're familiar with wire puzzles, you will probably very, very quickly realize that the wiggly component is, uh, you know, it's trivial. It's actually not really part of the puzzle. It's kind of a decoration, but sometimes it isn't, you know, sometimes parts of the puzzle that look funny, like, you know, if they're, if they're shaped like a dog or something, like maybe the, the actual shape and the angle of the ears of the dog actually matter for, for the solution. So. You know, a lot of things that may look trivial may actually not be. Now, this is probably one of the most basic uh, wire puzzles, um, but I, I really like it because, you know, it illustrates a lot of the, the metaphors. Um, very, very importantly, I would say, in some sense, in order to kind of um, arrive at a solution to this, you have to realize, and this is, you know, this is a very fun kind of like figure grounding version here, which is that, if you take these kind of like topologically speaking, as opposed to, you know, just kind of like the rigid structure of it, you will realize that topologically speaking, the piece is already out. You know, if there's some operations you can do to it, you know, without like obviously, you know, uh, uh, you know, topological operations like, um, like yeah, breaking or, or, or sticking or anything like that, or making holes, like, no, if it's just like, you know, moving it and wiggling it around and you can get it out, it means that topologically speaking, it was already out. And I find that very beautiful. So uh, one way of also kind of trying to think about it is that, um, you know, once you have like really examined the puzzle, you can kind of like close your eyes and imagine that the solution is already there, you know, because it's already out. You just have to figure out in what way the piece is already outside. It was free all along. And of course, yeah, there's a lot of metaphors there were like a lot of crazy situations in life where you may feel claustrophobic because it's too many constraints, you know, it's surrounded by, yeah, impossible expectations or, or very, very difficult people and, and so on. Like in some sense, yeah, you may feel trapped. You may think there's absolutely no way out or exit, but you know, if you have the attitude of actually you're always free, you have, always been free it's just you know you've convinced yourself maybe using data from the outside environment that you weren't free but then the question is 
assume that you are free, in what way are you free? How is it the case that you're already out? And in this case, well, I'll show you the, the solution. It's not too complicated. Basically, you have to realize that the little shape was outside all along. And I mean, oh, there you go. Um, the other, you know, very beautiful thing is that, you know, for solving these puzzles, you actually don't require force at any point in time. I mean, if you do require force, you know, it's a poorly crafted wire puzzle. Um, and that it's a, I mean, I would say, yeah, there's kind of like three characteristics that also are very beautiful of these kind of puzzles, which is that the thing that allows you to solve them is, you know, cleverness, perseverance, and freedom of mind. You know, realizing that, you know, just not becoming claustrophobic about it, realizing you're already free. Uh, this one I, I like a lot, uh, you know, it's a little like a bit more, more complicated, but again, like this is kind of in the relatively easy category, but uh, for illustration purposes, you know, it's uh, quite wonderful. And uh, I'll just like solve this one for, for you guys. Uh, basically, uh, there are like a couple steps and usually that's what will be involved in here is kind of like realizing that there's like a few key operations you have to do to take the puzzle from one state to another. Um, and there's often going to be kind of several stages that you have to go through. Uh, here, for example, I just did one operation. Uh, now I've got to put it all the way here, move the circle. And I mean, for this one kind of a spoiler is you have to, you know, the, the tricky thing here is you have to solve two constraints at once, um, which is how do you get it out of this circle and how you get it out of this other circle. And the answer is, you actually do it simultaneously. <laughs> you make it go through both of the circles at the same time, and there you go. Then you're outside. And I'll just uh, put it back in uh, just uh, uh, because of OCD. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, clean after yourself. Redo the puzzle, put it back in. So, um, yes, so that's uh, wire puzzles. And uh, it's there, there's there's kind of like a beautiful metaphor here with a problem of other minds because I actually would claim that the solution is in some sense like staring us in the nose. It was there from the beginning. There was no problem of other minds if you had been able to conceptualize it properly from the very beginning. Um, but you know, there might be a couple kind of like somewhat non-trivial moves in the solution that I will offer. But in retrospect, hopefully it will be clear that, you know, we weren't, you know, permanently enclosed in our, you know, egocentric world simulations without the ability of, in a sense, understanding the rest of the universe. No, you're actually, actually free. We just need the proper techniques and understanding to realize that fundamental freedom that we all have. So um, let's talk about the, the problem of other minds. So... Um, I mean, a lot of people legitimately have kind of like solipsistic crises, like sometime in, in their life, oftentimes like in, in their teen years, um, which is like around the time where, you know, you're uh, old enough to actually start having interesting ideas, but not old enough for people to have broken you into not caring about ideas very deeply. So basically teenagers on average will actually be some of the people who take ideas the most seriously, despite, you know, however, you know, oppositional defiance disorder behavior they may have actually to some extent that's them trying to get out of the encasing of the mind constructs of other people's expectations and, and so on. So yeah, I mean, teenagers are trying to solve a wire puzzle, you, you could say, um, sometimes, you know, not very successfully or wisely, but yeah, I mean, there's kind of these think for yourself and that's uh, very beautiful and I think uh, absolutely should be cultivated in tandem with, you know, a commitment to help all sentient beings, you know, kind of like to counterbalance it. But don't let the group mind, you know, be an, an oppressive force. Remember, you're always fundamentally free. It's just a matter of how you solve the puzzle to realize that freedom. Um, the desire, you know, to understand the experience of others, I think it's a very profound thing. That yes, I mean, if you're in a solipsistic crisis and you're skeptical of the consciousness of others, yeah, I mean, like, it can be extremely claustrophobic. You know, likewise, there's, yeah, this qualia you could associate with the feeling that you will always be stuck in your particular experience and not be able to experience, you know, what others experience. Even, you know, how, however much they describe it, fundamentally, there's a feeling 
for some people, not everybody, that, yeah, there's kind of a, uh, you're all alone in your own universe. Again, it's a particular qualia. I don't think it's a insight <laughs> into the nature of reality, although it can present itself that way. Uh, it, it's actually uh, a weird alloy of like feelings and thought forms and philosophical perspectives that kind of congeals into a claustrophobic feeling. Again, if you have a claustrophobic feeling like that, it's a wire puzzle. You know, you're actually fundamentally free. You just need to figure out what are the proper operations to, to realize that freedom. Okay. Um, um, it would be amazing to actually be able to show one's experiences to others. I mean, like as somebody who cares so deeply about, you know, unique, beautiful, let's say high entropy alloys of consciousness. And, you know, there's so much, so much hyper valuable experiences full of insights and understanding that it would be just so amazing if we could like record it and share with others. For example, the beautiful experience you might have had when you solved a particular math proof, if, you know, that rocks your boat <laughs> or your first kiss. Um, what was that like? Um, or a meditation insight. You know, a lot of these things, yeah, I mean, I think, of course, a lot of people do meditation for the purpose of, you know, liberating themselves from, from suffering and, and, and so on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, to some extent, I think a lot of the motivation that exists in people uh, trying to encourage others to meditate, for example, is, is actually somewhat based on being able to share those insights and understandings with uh, somebody else. And, uh, yeah, I mean, finding reliable ways of doing that would be would be awesome. Um, uh, I'll, I'll read you like a, a, a quote by um, Nick Bostrom in his uh, uh, basically letter from Utopia, a uh, little essay uh, or story. It's very beautiful. I highly recommend uh, listening to it or reading it. But uh, there's a part that like really struck a chord that exemplifies to me, yeah, this kind of like urge of being able to share the most beautiful and profound experiences that you have with others. So this is from the point of view of a hypothetical entity in the future that exists in utopia. And it says to you, you could say, I am happy that I feel good. You could say that I feel surpassing bliss, but these are words invented to describe human experience. What I feel is as far beyond human feeling as my thoughts are beyond human thought. I wish I could show you what I have in my mind. If only I could share one second of my conscious life with you. Ah. And yeah, I mean, if you're an MDMA, that's a very, very valid and beautiful feeling to have. <laughs> I wish I could show you one second of, of that, that beautiful, pure, pure state of, of love and and yeah, sense of understanding and uh, incredible self-honesty. That would be be very beautiful. Um, importantly, too, I mean, there's kind of this uh, French quote. It says, "Tout comprendre, c'est tout pardonner," which is in English, "To un to understand all is to forgive all." And I think in in this premise, essentially, is yeah, a deeper understanding that. There's no good or bad people or, you know, animals, non-human animals. Um, we're all trapped in our individual world simulations. And the parameters of our world simulations makes it so that basically what we actually do, how we act, the things that we do, feel like they make total sense. Even though, you know, they may actually be bad shit insane <laughs> from a, you know, kind of more objective, you know, sober uh, maybe grounded point of view, uh, if such a thing actually exists. I'll talk about that in, in, in a minute. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, even in the face of atrocities um, and the horrible things that happen in, in, in life, if we could actually understand what it feels like to be in the world simulation of the people who did those atrocities or behaved in that way, it would make sense. It would make sense that from where they stood, it was a, what felt like the appropriate, if not reasonable, course of action. And, you know, that's something we all will have to wrestle with 
as we understand consciousness better that like all of this energy that we have put in into constructing kind of a, a big evil or a big demon or a big you know bad thing that is out there that we should fight um that when that isn't for example you know actual just raw suffering <laughs> or something like that when it's actually like against an agent that yeah that's a very crazy delusional actually like mismatch of reference that we just simply don't know what we are talking about and of course we do require to be very open to information to understand other people's perspectives and where they're coming from and and so on but even with that i mean it's so difficult to overcome our own feelings our own parameters of our world simulation the things that we think that we have to protect or everything will be destroyed and so on all of those things yeah are very idiosyncratic and individual and uh, yeah i mean the the feeling of trying to avoid you know a horrible situation is probably very much present even in people who are doing the worst things you could imagine to others so yeah i mean they're being driven by very much very similar feelings that you and i are driven by just will have to come to terms with that um that said um oh yeah i guess like one <laughs> interesting point though is like i think this kind of perspective of like well everybody's trying their best in some fundamental sense actually becomes like quite accessible on 5-MeO DMT, which again, it's such a powerful psychedelic. I, I wouldn't, you know, recommend it nearly willy. Um, in, in general, actually, I would not recommend it. <laughs> I would recommend it only to people who, you know, really require kind of a, a therapeutic benefit or a hardcore, you know, quillia core psychonauts who are like, you know, very rational and like actually know what they're doing. And they're, you know, starting in small dosages, being very rational about it, having a cedar, not doing it while you're drunk etc etc but it does seem to be for a lot of people that kind of a uh, the very powerful very deep non-dual qualia that emerges in 5-MeO DMT it very much gives you this perspective of you know to understand all is to forgive all that like even the worst you know cult leaders and the worst you know army generals the most cruel you know Genki Scan and so on they're all part of the universal wave function. And that's us. You know, ultimately, yeah, it's kind of the, the wave function is shooting its own foot, you could say, uh, when it's uh, hurting, hurting itself and following into crazy evolutionary dynamics and the game theory that comes with it. And anyway, it's a, it's a horrifying situation in, in a lot of cases, but it makes sense from the point of view of every point in space time, basically. Yeah, every point in space time is, yeah, trying to avoid its own hell, which is perceived as avoiding hell itself, of course, because of egocentric bias and so on, pursuing its own heaven as well. Um, and again, if they don't have an adequate, you know, representation, if, you know, high fidelity representation of the minds of others, then yeah, I mean, goodness knows what you're capable of doing, you know, in order to avoid your own personal hell or your, own, you know, pursue your own personal heaven. So. Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, that is something that 5-MeO DMT is very powerful at, just giving you this very powerful, visceral understanding that everybody's trying their best. <laughs> it's, it's really crazy. Um, and I would say, though, that um, there is quite a bit of romanticism, too, when it comes to sharing our experiences with others. And the truth is that, I mean, we are encased in a you know, self-replicating machinery, has a lot of adversarial strategies and, you know, ultimately a lot of the things that we do and feel are actually to further the welfare of our genes rather than of conscious beings. Again, I would refer to consciousness versus replicators to kind of a, an extensive discussion on how to get out of this mess <laughs> that, that we're in uh, and basically enact the preferences and the telos of consciousness itself as opposed to those of our selfish genes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, basically for that reason, if you were actually going to connect and phenomenally bind your consciousness with those of people around you and non-human animals, unfortunately, it would actually be pretty horrifying in a lot of situations. Like, you know, people lie all the time. They, sh you know, they hide their true feelings, uh, worse, you know, like 
10% of people have like high impact chronic pain, you know, uh, there's like 2% of people who have schizophrenia, some of them have extreme cases of it, uh, you know, depression, extreme anxiety, uh, paranoia, you name it, you know, and, uh, and there's like everywhere around us. And yeah, of course, there's kind of the, the hippie desire of let's all take high doses of LSD and dance around in a campfire and become one and everything will be better. Well, that actually feels amazing when it happens because of annealing dynamics that give rise to, you know, high harmony, high energy, high symmetry, high valence states of consciousness that imprint you with a feeling of all being one is a beautiful thought. And, you know, there is something very beautiful about it. And I think it can actually solve a lot of game theoretical problems, but we should actually, you know, be pretty down to earth about like the actual lived experiences of the organisms around us and is not great for a, a lot of circumstances now um if you could selectively do so i mean like group mind melding on mdma yes sign me up that would be that would be amazing you know kind of like joining a, a group mind that they're all on mdma or something like that or 2cb i don't know but like one of those like mind spaces fantastic uh typical Darwinian states of consciousness, you know, I suspect we would actually be pretty horrified. <laughs> Apologies. I know this is not like a yeah standard. Uh, it kind of clashes with uh, romanticism in, in this space. But uh, yeah, anyway, um, I will say now getting into the actual weeds of the problem that, hey, I am and people at QRI, you know, in, in general, we are epistemological optimists and that means that a lot of classic problems that a lot of people have given up actually classic problems for people that have written books and you know made an entire career out of trying to convince others that the problem is unsolvable um, we actually think you just need to be more clever and patient and persevere and in some sense yeah I mean start out with the assumption that it is solvable and that there is actually gold in here, you know, beautiful platinum, <laughs> the gems of, of the state space of consciousness. They're waiting for you. You just have to put in the work and be motivated <laughs> and pursue them. And I promise there are riches and riches to be found. Uh, yeah, I'm actually very serious. Uh, don't let, um, you know, the PTSD of grad school, uh, yeah, or postdoc positions or something like that, close your mind and make you completely cynical about you know our ability to understand no 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 i think better yeah i mean like take yeah ex exotic states of consciousness seriously and you know really study what they are capable of and uh, and you will realize that there are many kinds of understanding that yeah i mean they're not part of our standard medium of thought but they're part of the state space of consciousness yeah it's beautiful there's beautiful gems of understanding out there to be discovered and cultivated um and uh I mean, you know some examples here is like you know i'm extremely optimistic about the prospect of actually mapping the state space of consciousness in a rigorous and you know helpful you know insightful way also you know something that definitely mike and mike johnson and david pierce uh you know really have are like are, have like championed as kind of a, an idea for a while is that you know, valence or hedonic tone, the pleasure pain axis uh, is as an objective feature of an experience uh, as, for example, the rest mass of an electron. That this is actually a objective property of the universe. So that like how good I'm feeling right now, how good you're feeling right now, you know, the, the spectrum of consonance and dissonance and what's actually bugging you and, and the imperfections and the tensions and so on, they all aggregate to a holistic sense of how good you feel and that that is as objectively so, you know, as the rest mass of the electron, which is, yeah, something that you can measure up in a lab and two labs will actually agree if they have the proper instruments. And yeah, I mean, in the future, I very much expect that with a a new science of consciousness we will be able to point a theory and say yep this lizard is in a lot of pain this rabbit is in ecstatic bliss <laughs> i know that with uh, quite quite a high confidence because 
yeah, everything will line up. Um, and even, you know, perhaps I might lose some credibility with some people, but I'm such an epistemological optimist that I actually think that it is possible to understand why there is something rather than nothing. So much so that I actually have a, you know, a, an hour long video on that on, on this channel, if you're curious. Again, I know you will probably start very skeptical. Who is this guy thinking that he can answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? You know, I don't know. Watch the video. Make up your own mind. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, I think in a lot of these cases, it's just people lack encouragement. People lack uh, faith that there is something to be found. And, you know, for sure, people just don't try hard enough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, that's my perspective here. Um, okay, so let's get on to the actual solution. Uh, well, first, um, what are the classic solutions? How do people tend to approach this problem? Um, so, very classic solutions are things such as, like, quote-unquote solutions, are things such as, well, we're all made of the same atoms. So, like, if we know that atoms can give rise to conscious experience, and you're made of atoms as well, then, you know, chances are you're also conscious, which is, yeah, some kind of like indirect inference in this, in this space. And I'm not gonna say that there's zero value here because there clearly is some value, but it's not particularly persuasive. If you're a solipsistic, you can still be like a dualist, for example. You could imagine all of this is a simulation, like, so the story that everything is made of atoms may not even actually be something you take very seriously. Um, so yeah, this particular argument may not really do it for you. I, I don't think it does it for, for a lot of people. Um, another kind of like tentative line of argument is to say that, you know, similar evolutionary timelines or we have very similar genetic makeup. I actually used to, I think like really believe these, like when I was 16, like I used, that was my solution is like, hey, our evolutionary history is such that, yeah, we're all so similar genetically that like, you know, chances are our brains basically give rise to the same kind of phenomenon. And yeah, I mean, I think like this is a good probabilistic argument, but again, if you're stuck in kind of a solipsistic hellscape or solipsistic asylum type of state of mind, yeah, this really will not persuade you at all, right? Like you might think, no, you guys are figments of my imagination and I am God and like you guys don't actually exist sort of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, let's find out uh, something better. Other people argue, for example, based on preference architecture, that uh, we all share the same, a very similar preference architecture and that maybe that has something to do with uh, consciousness. And, and in that case, you know, that's, uh, that's one way of, of going about it. Um, I, 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 you know, some people even argue, like, you know, Wittgenstein and others, with something that I personally find completely unpersuasive, but for some reason, a lot of people find yeah, uh, worthwhile, which is this notion of that there are no private, there's no private language, that like language only exists in order to sync up together experiences or, you know, different minds. I don't think, you know, Wittgenstein, well, he's not was looking particular at qualia <laughs> and valence and things like that. He was thinking more of like, you know, agents and uh, minds and, be, you know, ability to use language and so on. But yeah, anyway, um, yeah, the, the reasoning goes that language cannot arise with only one person, with only one mind, because it's actually about communicating internal states and so on. Therefore, because language exists, that means there is a community of users of that language and they all share the same substrate or, 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 or a similar enough substrate that the language can actually evolve. And you know, again, this is a probabilistic argument and I, no, I personally don't buy it because, you know, you can evolve little critters in a, you know, cellular automata machine that you can show they're not conscious because they don't solve the binding problem and they can still evolve a language and it's not going to be a private language. Not very persuasive. I'm sorry. Uh, another line of argument is based on algorithms that in a sense, if we map out what are the algorithms that, you know, what are the algorithmic correlates of consciousness <laughs> as opposed to the neural correlates, which a lot of functionalists would really not care very much about because of substrate independence. Again, there's videos about this I've all already put in, but um, um, they might say something like, hey, like if it turns out that a specific type of reinforcement learning algorithm is necessary for consciousness or necessary and sufficient, and you can show that another brain is implementing the same algorithm, 
then you can know with confidence that they are also conscious or something of that sort, which actually presupposes a particular place of consciousness within what's called Mars levels of analysis. Uh, in particular, it assumes that consciousness emerges at the algorithmic level, something that at, at QRI we, we actually don't, don't think it's true. Um, um, but yeah, so those are kind of um, uh, classic approaches. Again, personally, they're just not very persuasive. Uh, and in general, I think like, yeah, behavioral or algorithmic type of arguments, they're very brittle, especially because you can definitely, you know, construct counterexamples. So I, I don't think they're very credible. Um, now, where it starts to get really interesting, though, is, I mean, similar to what I was saying about being able to tell what the valence of a lizard or a, or a bunny uh, is, uh, basically is that if we do arrive at a very accurate, you know, formal theory of consciousness within Quilia formalism, where you actually say that, you know, for each moment of experience there is a mathematical object whose features are isomorphic to the phenomenology and you show it for yourself. You know, you have like a measuring device that is translating the state of your brain to, you know, a state of the wave function, which gets translated into a mathematical object. And it reads out and it says, yeah, you're actually experiencing blue and you're experiencing a red square and you're experiencing nostalgia, ennui, postmodern angst <laughs> and so on. And it's true that, yeah, like you, you can, you know, corroborate that isomorphism for yourself and then point that theory and that measuring device at different, you know, organisms and realize, oh my gosh, yes, my childhood friend turns out was conscious all along. Yeah, I mean, and that's a, I think more of a persuasive uh, kind of line of argumentation. Now, it will probably not convince a lot of people who believe in kind of a simulationist account um, or like or start out kind of like solipsistic and idealistic in the sense of a, yeah, every, everybody else is figments of my imagination and I am God type of uh, space. Yeah, a, a formal theory of consciousness might not persuade them because they might just consider that as like, that's just God imagining more things. You know, it's not going to necessarily, um, yeah, basically hit, uh, hit the points that, that truly matter here. So... Um, yeah, I mean, importantly, though, yeah, I mean, I, I do think like uh, an important phrase I would leave you with for this particular approach is this idea that the standard model of physics doesn't break down in the central nervous system. I mean, as far as we know, you know, it's particle accelerators, you know, kind of make particles collide at very, very, very close to the speed of light and see what happens and like they record what happens and like you know, within, you know, 17 digits of, uh, significant digits of precision, you know, the same thing happens over and over again. And like, yeah, I mean, basically physics seems to be extremely well verified in a lot of circumstances. And, you know, chances are in room temperature, you don't need exotic physics, you know, it's, what physics is telling is actually what's going on. <laughs> and that's happening in your brain too. So it's not like there is a fundamental discontinuity in kind of like the laws of reality just because you know it's in your in your brain sort of thing uh in that sense yeah i mean i think like a a, a, a qualia formalist theory of consciousness that agrees with your own experiences in a perfect you know structural match i would personally find that very persuasive again not everybody but um that's why we will go into the really kind of core solution here the innovation so um and you actually require two elements now i used to think that only one of those elements was actually necessary and the truth is that one of those elements actually takes you very far which is this idea of a interthalamic bridge basically following from the principle that okay like the two hemispheres of your of your brain uh they're connected through a corpus callosum and through the thalamus uh, basically, um, you can sort of dissociate them and make them like different subjects of experience, depending on your interpretation of the research. If you cut the corpus callosum, you make them split brain patients. Uh, so in a sense, you can kind of like show that, you know, a, a mind that was unified, you can segment it into two separate, you know, subjects of experience. That's very suggestive of the possibility that if we actually had the proper hardware, 
potentially even like biological neurons as, as a kind of like a tube that connects your thalamus to my thalamus. Um, you know, the my, it might actually just be a engineering problem to make that work and then synchronize our brain waves and solve the phenomenal binding problem so that we actually become one subject of experience. Again, I mean, this would be so strange and trippy, I am sure. Um, all of a sudden you would have two visual fields and if you introspect about your past, you will probably have like images coming from two incompatible pasts and compa compatible sense of self. You will also realize, you know, to what extent the sense of an avatar of who you are <laughs> was, uh, yeah, basically just a particular flavor of qualia. And it's not, you know, as the Buddhists would say, if you identify with form, you're in for a bad time because actually you're not any kind of form even your innermost sense of self, that's really not what you are. You truly are pure consciousness uh, embedded in a particular structure. But um, yeah, basically, if, if you do uh, a, a thalamic bridge with somebody else and all of a sudden you find yourself with two visual fields and two emotional fields and body uh, maps and so on. Uh, yeah, I would say that's a, a successful, you know, uh, mind melding that, that is going on. And uh, I used to think that this was enough. That in a sense, if you could mind meld with others and you have that, all of a sudden you do have two visual fields, etc., etc., that proves without a shadow of a doubt that the other people were conscious to begin with. Now, uh, and I, I think I used to actually talk about this in 2011 or something like that, and um, uh, even way earlier actually, but uh, uh, at least in the kind of rationalist community and so on. And, um, and I actually remember specifically both Eliezer Yudkowsky and Brian Tomasic, who are, I guess, like, you know, thought leaders in that space uh, to some certain important extent, uh, pretty significant extent, I would say. Uh, yeah, they, they basically said, like, no, that's not going to be enough. Why? Uh, it's actually for a subtle reason, which is that it's like if you connect additional hardware to your to your brain and all of a sudden you have new abilities or new capacities for for experience, you're not going to know for sure whether um, it is in the interaction or the interface or the aggregate of those new pieces of hardware and your central nervous system that allows for new kinds of experience. But at the same time that those independent of you, they might not be conscious. In other words, Brian Tomasic and Elias Yudkowsky were pointing out that even if you connect your brain via a thalamic bridge to somebody else and your consciousness becomes drastically expanded all that you will have learned rigorously speaking at the very least is that you know the pairing of your nervous system and its nervous system is conscious but you're not going to have learned that that other nervous system all alone is conscious on its own uh, now there's kind of like parsimony considerations here obviously and like Occam's razor's considerations obviously that like if you do legitimately have a much bigger experience when you connect to somebody else uh like literally like more qualia right like you, you have like two visual fields like you count the number of specs of experience and it comes out as like yeah it's double uh there is the argument that you can you can make that hey like the the hardware of my nervous system really like had like would cap out in terms of like amount of qualia that it could generate at this level and like above that you know it means that i, I must be used I, I i must be incorporating a new hardware that in a sense has the capacity for consciousness on its own now that line of reasoning also fails as it turns out and the reason is is that we already actually know that there are interventions that increase <laughs> the qualia capacity of your nervous system by a very big margin i mean <clears throat> uh smoking DMT, for example, or, you know, taking ayahuasca or whatever, uh, at the peak of an intense experience, like legitimately, you may ex be experiencing, you know, a multiple number of like qualia. Like if you aggregate all the specs of your experience uh, in normal everyday life and you get, you know, something like a hundred, you know, you know, uh, micro phenomenological specs per second or something like that. Uh, maybe on DMT, you get to like, you know, 400. Or like 800 or something like that so and that's just with your nervous system now of course some people will actually use this as evidence that is not just your brain 
that actually you're actually interacting with other entities in hyperspace or some other mind independent, you know, region of the wave function or whatever it may be. And, and sure, actually, that's an interesting perspective. But yeah, I mean, like parsimony considerations too, I would basically just suggest that, no, I mean, the brain is, as Anders and Maggie would, would describe it as, it's a, you know, Qualia warp engine basically has this tremendous capacity for creating world simulations of unfathomable depth and brilliance and intensity. It's just that it's usually at a very low capacity level because it's not necessary for evolutionary reasons. So yeah, I mean like the quilia amount kind of like line of argumentation may yeah, just not pan out in this particular case uh, as it turns out. So what can we do? So the innovation here, I mean, again, other people have thought of like merging with others and using that as the proof that, you know, others are conscious. Uh, that is not the innovation. The innovation comes from the second ingredient, which is phenomenal puzzles. And phenomenal puzzles are puzzles that you can only solve by doing comparisons between actual raw sensate, you know, quilia varieties. Uh, well, they could also be like thought forms and so on, but basically the raw quilia values of experience, comparing them, uh, using that as kind of like the signature that you're actually interfacing with a conscious entity. So, and uh, the thing is like, this is actually kind of tricky, but uh, uh, I'll give you like one example of a, of a, um, a phenomenal puzzle. So, um, the puzzle might be, arrange all colors, all quilia values of phenomenal color into a map such that the distance between every point in that map, uh, where basically each color gets assigned a point, um, is proportional to the number of just noticeable differences between them. And for some qualia varieties, such as the qualia of phenomenal color, actually there is a real solution to this, which is called the CL Lab color space. The, the QR logo, it's pretty close to, to a perfect rendition of it. Um, I think there's like slight imperfection of how it's aligned. I'm sure we will correct that in the future. Uh, we will, but uh, but uh, it, it's, got, it's pretty close. And essentially what you will see is that there is actually two axes that emerge, which is the yellow blue axis or purple. Yeah, that's kind of the mistake here. Um, but yeah, it's pretty subtle. Actually, it would be kind of like here would be the the opposite as opposed to here. So the, the yellow blue axis, and then you have the red green axis, and then you have the black and white axis, which would be kind of like a third dimension, you know, how bright, how bright it is. And, um, and basically it turns out that this is a Euclidean space. And this is not, you know, my opinion. This is like from psychophysics. This is actually getting people to basically uh, tell you when two colors are just perceptibly different. And basically that becomes kind of the unit of the distance. Like it's, it's called a just noticeable difference. And empirically, if you arrange the colors in a map, you will see that they form this Euclidean space. And that's actually not even a given, right? Because mapping out things in terms of just noticeable differences doesn't entail that you will actually get something that fits a Euclidean space at all. I mean, actually, in the generic case, uh, what's called hyperbolic embeddings are generally more accurate. And I, I, I've been predicting for years that the state space of smell uh, actually is a hyperbolic space. And uh, yeah, just uh, saw a paper yesterday that, uh, <laughs> yeah, suggests that actually hyperbolic embeddings are way better fit to actually explain kind of the, the map of just noticeable differences, the, the metric of, of a scent space. Um, the reason I, I suspected that was because like combinations of scents actually can be pretty sensitive and, uh, well, that, that's a rabbit hole. I'll, I'll cover that topic at a, another time. But it turns out that with color, it is a 3D Euclidean space. And importantly, uh, once you do that work, you will realize, and you know, this sounds silly. I know it's silly, but it's not. Or I know it sounds silly, but it really isn't, which is this idea that 
how many primary colors there are. And a lot of people will say, well, there's three. It's RGB, obviously. You know, that's just how monitors work. Other people will say like it's green, blue, and yellow because that's the, the elements that you need for paint to get it, create all the colors. They're both wrong, actually. Is it, it's not the case that there are three primary colors. There's actually four. <laughs> and I know this sounds like subjective and, and just, you know, who are you to say this? But if you actually do a CL lab, basically a linearized color mapping, and you introspect on the qualities that you see, you will realize that there are actually two kinds of colors. There are primary colors, which are yellow, blue, green, and red. And then there are four derived colors, which are orange, um, yellow, sorry, bluish green, yellowish green, and purple. And, uh, and seriously, I mean, like, isn't it the case that orange contains both red and yellow qualia in it? It's kind of orange is kind of a chemical composition of the qualia of red and yellow simultaneously. It's a composite color. And this is phenomenologically speaking. I'm not talking about RGB or combining, you know, paints or anything like that. I'm talking about quilia, the status of quilia. Whereas uh, yellow, you know, yellow, geometrically speaking, is between yellowish green and orange. But yellow, when you actually introspect on it and look at it very carefully and contrast, you will see that, no, this is not an average of these other two colors that are neighboring with it. Not at all. It actually is pretty clear. Again, <laughs> you need to actually pay attention to the colors to truly understand this. this you, you don't take my word for it. Actually, look at a rainbow for a long time and actually take serious this, this question. And you will realize that yellow is a pure color and it's not a mixture of orange and yellowish green but yellowish green is a mixture of green and yellow and that this is the true map that like this idea that yellow and blue you know mixed together cause green you know as a kid i remember it didn't make any sense it's crazy like green is a beast of its own it's a completely different thing than both yellow and blue so what's going on in there Whereas orange, I mean, it kind of makes sense that you add, you know, yellow paint and, and red paint and you get orange. Like, yeah, that's kind of like a middle point, but not green. Green, it's its own thing. Its own thing. Again, it sounds silly, but it's not. <laughs> it really isn't. And the answer is that basically, you know, linear combinations of paints and so on, they don't give rise to, you know, the exact geometric middle point between those colors. The, the, the mapping is actually more complicated. And it has to do with the receptor types in her eyes and, and the particular way in which spectrums add up or cancel out. And it's, it's, a, it's a whole mess. But that kind of like underpins the fact that actually at the level of qualia space, it's a much more simple, perfectly geometric structure. And this is something that you can arrive at independently if you actually do a just noticeable differences study um, and you take qualia seriously. So the puzzle of basically what are the primary colors you know that i would say it's you know it's kind of an advanced advanced puzzle it's not trivial you you do require kind of the equipment but you do require to be conscious to actually solve that because you require to do quilia comparisons um there, there's like obviously a caveat that has to do with like whether there's like some kind of structural isomorphism that a p zombie could be doing but I think like at this point, like super strong pars parsimony considerations actually would suggest that, yeah, no, actually the actual comparing of quilia has computational and functional implications. Um, basically, this gets a little bit into panpsychism, which is that, yeah, basically the behavior of the world can be explained in terms of basically quilia comparisons that are happening <laughs> all, all around us at a microscopic level. Um, and that, uh, yeah, basically physics is describing the behavior of quilia comparisons and, and, and its evolution. Uh, but, but yeah, basically when you do introspection, you're kind of like pointing that property of the universe that you can actually do quilia comparisons and, you know, doing it for like basically mapping out the state space. Um, okay, so that's a particular puzzle. So now having a puzzle is not enough. Uh, the reason is 
that how you communicate the puzzle is not epistemically grounded. Basically, when you say, hey, can you map out the state space of color and tell me what are the primary colors, what are the derived colors? Um, the problem with that is that we cannot actually trust um, uh, the fact that like there's going to be a, a, a correct equal mapping between sensory stimuli and quilia values. And, and to a large extent, actually, we know that that's just not the case, right? Obviously, there's people who are colorblind or red, green, colorblind, etc. And there's also people who, um, for example, they have a different receptor types in the tongue, such that uh, tasting cilantro, it tastes like soap. So, yeah, I mean, basically, my prediction is that we actually live in, in very different mappings, like the, the uh, sensory input to quilia mapping is different from person to person and there's a significant genetic load on that there's a significant environmental and also like kind of training or cognitive style load to that what do you pay attention to what kind of attention dynamics do you follow and so on so that's that's different that's different so you can't actually just ask a person to solve this puzzle and if they show you the solution you're not going to actually be really sure uh, that they are conscious because the mapping is uncertain like if, if, if they're wrong like if they arrive at a different set of inferences, they could still be right. It's just that their mapping is different. I hope I hope that makes sense. So that is where you actually require also a phenomenal connection, basically a, a reversible thalamic breach, mind melding. And it's in the mixture of these two things, phenomenal puzzles and mind melding, that you're actually able to arrive at a solution to the problem of other minds and I have it in a diagram that I'm about to show you. So basically, prove that your friend has a mind of its own in eight easy steps <laughs> with mind melding and phenomenal puzzles. Uh, so, I mean, essentially, uh, what you require um, is A, uh, an, important, uh, an important thing to, to point out is that um, uh, the solution here will only work for one person and you actually need to do the test twice such that um, each person can know that the other person was independently conscious. Uh, the other caveat to this whole test is that if the other person doesn't solve the puzzle, it doesn't mean that they're not conscious. Like They might just have not been able to solve the puzzle, right? Like uh, So basically this can have a lot of false negatives, but it pretty much doesn't have false positives uh, modulo how hard it is to fake a solution to the puzzle. But like if, if the puzzle is like properly calibrated and it's like very difficult and actually the other person solves it in this, in this uh, setup, you, you would know with very high confidence the other person is actually conscious. Okay, so um, the steps are, so basically you start out A and B and let's say that you want A to know that B is conscious. So what do you do? So you start out like this. Um, the second part is, um, I, I apology, like actually there's like one step in between. So like they, st they start out like, you know, step one, you, you are vibe. None of the persons have actually heard the, the Quelia puzzle at all. Then you mind melt. Sorry, that would be like 1.5. Step 1.5. You mind melt and you do this thing that is called a Quilia calibration. So basically, as you're connected to the other person, all of a sudden you experience two visual fields. And in some sense, you and the other person become one. Arguably, maybe you were all one to begin with due to open individualism, or each time slice is its own entity due to empty individualism. Either case, I, I wouldn't find it ontologically too surprising if, if you know, like mixing two nervous systems together and actually putting them in sync and so on, actually you know, allows the, the nervous systems to sustain a unified experience. So if that happens, there's going to be something kind of crazy as well that like the two visual fields, even if they're looking at the same objects, the objects may actually look kind of different <laughs> because the mapping may be different, right? So your blue might be my green, right? And, and uh, I mean, we don't know what the probability of that is at the moment, but basically you require first and foremost um, before you do the puzzle or anything like that to connect and do a quilia calibration so that we look at basically 
color spacers, so synth spaces, and so on, uh, from both visual fields at once, or from both sensory fields at once. And we basically create a table of how each of the quilia values map onto each other. In what way are the lenses of your sensory apparatus and the way your, your brain is processing that, that sensory apparatus information, in what way there is a correct mapping. Okay, so you do a quilia calibration. That is uh, the first part. Then you disconnect. Then in step two, you put B to sleep. Basically, B has to be, you know, temporarily unconscious here. Um, and A learns the quilia puzzle. Here I'm basically providing a, you know, a very simple quilia puzzle, which is the question of, uh, out of these three colors, which one is the odd one out, you know? And I mean, the solution should be pretty obvious that like the odd one out is going to be black because uh, there's something about like the information content that in a sense, like both these kind of specific green and this specific uh, orange, they have a, a level of quilia specificity. Their cosmograph complexity is higher than that of black because that would be much more of a basic low information, you know, qualia. Uh, and I, I basically, I do think that you, you can rank qualia in terms of their intrinsic irreducible information content. Um, and yeah, there's probably like something very, very deep uh, in physics about that, uh, that, that particular correspondence. Uh, but yeah, okay, so the, the question is, which one is the odd one out? Uh, then uh, you mind meld, this is like, a, well, step three is like the person knows the puzzle, uh, but doesn't know the solution to the puzzle. And uh, B hasn't heard it yet. And B is actually not even supposed to see the puzzle or hear the puzzle. What happens is in, in step four, as you actually become one with the other person, you quote unquote, tell the puzzle to yourself again. But you know, it's kind of like you're telling it now in a new environment, a new mental environment that contains two visual fields and maybe two inner dialogues and so on. And uh, in that way, uh, and you take into account the quilia calibration, so that basically you say like, okay, so I got like green, orange, and black, or whatever it is. And these are like the quilia values. I'm not talking about like, you know, what wavelengths of light or anything like that. Um, and like, thanks to the quilia calibration, you know, you can actually faithfully pass on this information that yes, this is the quilia we're talking about, not the frequencies of light. Okay, now step five, this is very important. You put A to sleep or make it completely unconscious. Actually, I mean, ideally you would, um, yeah, basically uh, uh, sedate it, you know, put it out of commission, your high dose, uh, you know, ketamine or propofol or something like that. Basically, you, you want to avoid any kind of uh, subconscious processing at all. So that it's kind of like, almost kind of like frozen in time. So that, uh, yeah, basically there's no quilia computing happening in A for a little bit. And B is given enough time to basically do all the quilia comparisons necessary to arrive at the solution. And the, the cool thing too is that the, the, the phenomenal puzzles could actually be calibrated for specific time windows. So you say like, you know, people with disability, with these like working memory, etc., will generally solve these a puzzle within 10 minutes or something like that you know 99 percent of people solve this puzzle within 10 minutes uh, so you give 10 minutes to the other person to solve it then when the other person runs out of time or says like hey i found the solution in this case you know circling the the black dot because that's the the odd one out the one that contains the least information by a very long shot uh, then that's a step six and step seven is you mind meld again now, A hasn't had any chance to actually think about this problem or do the necessary quilia comparisons that are actually, um, uh, that you can't get away with uh, without doing in order to solve the problem. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I bit my tongue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, maybe a, a sip of coffee. Mm. So, you mind meld again, and again, you tell the answer to yourself, to this expanded mind meld itself. And then you disconnect. And if A can provide the answer, then you can infer that B 
actually did qualia comparisons to solve the problem while A was unconscious. And if you can do qualia comparisons, yeah, that means you're conscious. You're actually operating with qualia. You're doing qualia computing. You're conscious. Um, so there you go, folks. This is solving the problem of other minds with mind melding and phenomenal puzzles. Now, there are some caveats. I mean, I, I do think like by this point, like the, you know, parsimony considerations are just like so brutally strong. <laughs> then I would say, yeah, you're, you probably should just give in and say, yeah, actually, this is proof that others are conscious um, and that I'm not, you know, in a solipsistic world or something like that, because, hey, Quilia computing happened. Like a non-trivial problem was actually solved by doing Quilia comparisons outside of your own mind. You know, information was produced, you know, uh, yeah. So obviously some kind of computational system that uses qualia happened outside of you. So yeah, others are conscious as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think that's uh, really cool that uh, maybe at least in principle, it's possible to prove that others are conscious and escape our solipsistic uh, ideations and so on. Now, uh, I guess like a, a fascinating thing, um, an extension to this, which um, I owe to uh, uh, Quentin, who, who, who works at QRI and uh, is doing a lot of amazing te technical work in uh, neuroimaging and uh, testing uh, yeah, various like theories of consciousness. Uh, yeah, basically with uh, amazing neuroimaging data sets and EEG of uh, meditators and, and so on. Well, he's one of the persons, uh, one of the smartest persons I know, and, and he... Um, yeah, basically has engaged very deeply with kind of like a lot of these ideas. And uh, he figured out actually a way of extending these to another domain. And uh, for this, I need to introduce like a third crazy idea. Uh, this one exists already, but it's called the WADA test, uh, which is, yeah, pretty invasive. But it's one way of kind of a telling which is your verbal brain, verbal hemisphere, in order to ablate the other one, in order to prevent seizures. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a, a step in the treatment of epilepsy that is treatment resistance. So the WADA test basically involves um, uh, with a particular artery uh, in the neck where the blood already is like splitting into two channels. Uh, so basically if you inject a drug like pantobarbital in only one of these uh, arteries, it will reach only one of the hemispheres at a time. And so you can put to sleep your left hemisphere for like, you know, half an hour. And then you can put to sleep your right hemisphere for like maybe another half an hour. And uh, I don't know, I, I find this mind boggling, obviously, that like, you know, you could see what it's like to be only half of you one at a time. And um, and yeah, I mean, like experimenting with these for, for the sake of consciousness research would be fascinating. I, I would love to try it on myself if it's not too unhealthy, you know. <laughs> There's a few micromords. I'm actually, yeah, I think it would be fine uh, with trying it out. I'm, I'm just very curious what it's like to have half of your brain literally, literally asleep uh, in deep, deep sleep and the other one actually fully, fully conscious. Um, and uh, I mean, that, uh, that on its own, it's kind of like interesting that you may have like these weird uh, kind of like memory sequences where you start out like uh, being both of your hemispheres, then you're like lefty for a little bit and then you're righty for a little bit, and righty has no recollection of what happened uh, What happened to lefty. But then when you're like the whole brain again, you have recollection of both lefty and righty. And you know that lefty happened before, but you know that also righty didn't have recoll recollections of lefty. So anyway, like obviously this is like crazy from the point of view of uh, personal identity and strong argument against uh, closed individualism or any kind of like, yeah, theory of uh, uh, consciousness that has a... Uh, epiphenomenal, enduring metaphysical ego or anything of the sort. Um, but uh, again, for epistemological reasons, uh, uh, some people may actually not be convinced that one of the hemispheres is, is conscious. For example, somebody like Elias Yudkowsky, who has super strong beliefs that actually what brings you know consciousness into existence is verbal reasoning or like the capacity for self-reporting attentional states or things of that sort. I think, I mean, completely wrong-headed and misguided because yeah, I think consciousness is a evolutionarily ancient uh, discovery by, by, uh, by bio biology. 
And uh, I mean, I'm I sure suspect that in the Cambrian explosion, there were already a lot of like m tiny world simulations with very primitive qualia. Yeah, but uh, yeah, basically, uh, the cortex is a tiny component of what actually gives rise to consciousness. But you know, if you actually believe that consciousness requires verbal reasoning or self-reporting or something of the sort, then you may be skeptical that the right hemisphere is conscious on its own. Even if you do a WADA test and you have like these crazy lefty righty kind of uh, uh, different memories, like somebody like Elias Rutkowski might actually say, oh, that's just after the fact, your whole brain is reconstructing, you know, um, synaptic impressions that happen in the right hemisphere uh, and imposes the interpretation that it was conscious at the time, which it wasn't. Again, I don't think that's a very plausible argument, but uh, to the extent that people believe in it, um, then yeah, sure, we can say that, yeah, we, we wouldn't be for certain sure that both hemispheres can be independently conscious. So here is where you actually can bring together the three elements that we were talking about, which is, yeah, basically mind melding, which is like actually having the full brain together, phenomenal puzzles and the WADA test um, in, in a particular sequence. And so in this case, rather than A and B being two different persons and requiring kind of the futuristic mind melding technology, which we yeah currently currently don't have is still still a science fiction a and b could be your two hemispheres lefty and righty and we could do the same procedure with like well calibrated phenomenal puzzles and in a sense have one of your hemispheres solve one of these puzzles by doing quilia comparisons and the other hemisphere getting the answer without having to do any of the work and in that way be able to prove to itself that the other hemisphere actually was conscious on its own, independent of you, uh, of your, you as a hemisphere. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Uh, I didn't think of that. Uh, Quinton thought of that. So yeah, I mean, keep it up. Keep up the, the amazing new thoughts. I think it's uh, very encouraging uh, always to uh, uh, hear people uh, push the envelope or kind of like, uh, derive further interesting combinations between ideas or coming up with completely new ideas. So, yeah, so that's, uh, I think, like, the, the end of, uh, yeah, the problem of other minds. Hopefully, you know, fully wrapped up. Hopefully you can uh, stop feeling solipsistic. <laughs> we did it, we could say. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just want to conclude with, uh, yeah, kind of, like, thanking, thanking some people. Uh, I mean, like, honestly the solution to the problem of other minds is actually one of the reasons why I started the blog Qualia Computing. That like, you know, I used to think a lot about all of these things. I still do, but it used to be a little bit more frustrating because I had all of these thoughts, all of these like solutions to various classical problems in philosophy and so on. Um, but I, all I could really do at the time was like, you know, share it with friends and, and you know, have deep conversations and I remember people found it actually kind of frustrating that they wanted to share with other people. Hey, like, oh, there's this guy who always talks about consciousness and has like new, you know, maybe interesting perspectives, but you have to talk to him. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, people basically, uh, you know, in, in grad school or towards the end of my undergraduate, they were, yeah, encouraging me to actually write this out and, and put it online and, you know, get, a, get the conversation started. Uh, so, I mean, I definitely want to thank, uh, yeah, people like, from the Stanford Transhumanist Association back in the day, like Keaton and Blue and uh, Toder and Duncan, um, uh, Carl and Faust and, 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 and Juan Carlos. Uh, yeah, they, they all were like, dude, you should, you should write a blog. I, I would love to, to, to share your content. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, thank you so much for, for all the encouragement at, at the time. Uh, but actually I, I didn't do it even though I had that encouragement, partly because of uh, perfectionism um, and, uh, uh, but then, yeah, I mean, uh, very importantly, uh, David Pierce was very insistent that I should actually put, put, the, put this online. Um, and I think like the person who actually took me over the edge and made it happen was this, um, yeah, teacher, uh, uh, basically, f uh, from a pretty unusual class I took, uh, in grad school. 
uh, it was kind of like weird psychology therapy class, but like, yeah, just such a beautiful, beautiful experience. Uh, so that's uh, Professor Murphy Shigematsu. Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but uh, yeah, I mean, like, um, yeah, like he encouraged us to actually pick up a kind of like a, 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 a serious project, something that we, we had been procrastinating that we really wanted in our best interest, you know, kind of like, what is it that your higher self really wants out of you and, and do it and make it happen. And, uh, and that summer, you know, with encouragement of David Pierce and, and, uh, and Murphy, uh, I did it and started Qualia computing and yeah, talking about the solution to the problem of the other minds was one of the, you know, first things that I, I put up. And of course, yeah, I mean, I, I want to thank obviously, uh, yeah, Michael Johnson for all of the uh, great conversations over the years and, and great insights and Romeo Stevens and uh, more recently, yeah, like uh, Andrew Zuckerman and, and Quinton uh, and, uh, and Anders and Maggie and yeah, I mean, other people in, in, in the QRI sphere like Kenneth uh, and, uh, and Marcin and, and Mackenzie and Sean and yeah, I mean, I'm sure many more to come as well. And there's a lot of people I'm not mentioning right now because the list is pretty significant. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for all of the wonderful encouragement and creating a, yeah, these like sense that these thoughts actually matter and uh, they're fun to think about. And let's create a beautiful field where we can actually, yeah, discuss these and, and have fun with our minds. So with that, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, definitely I want to encourage you to you know start your own blog if you're interested in these sort of questions maybe your YouTube channel I, I'd love to engage with people who do response videos to you know my videos or content at QRI and so on uh, I also recommend if you want to kind of like get in touch uh, in Facebook there's this group called Quelia Computing Networking uh, so find it answer the questions and agree to the rules if you don't agree to the rules, I'm not going to let you in, <laughs> as it turns out. So you need to agree to the rules and answer the questions, and uh, uh, most likely I will, will let you in. Um, and also there's a uh, Quelia Research uh, subreddit, uh, link in the description, that also I encourage you to yeah post comments and post uh, you know links in there, start a discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, let's make this a, a beautiful, thriving community of people interested in, in Qualia and being free kind of solving the wire puzzle <laughs> that evolution put for us uh for consciousness to solve and basically yeah achieve actual self-authorship and and freedom freedom from from suffering and from ignorance so with that uh infinite bliss everybody thank you so much take care and see you next time